So as the introduction here said, this is really the chance to see how does the, the call, the, the sort of the exhortations of Humana Vitae, how does it actually play out? Um, how does the rubber really meet the road in clinical practice? So it's a privilege and honor to be here to um, talk with you all today. Hopefully some parts of my talk can be applicable to uh, any of you who are coming from different areas <clears throat> uh, looking to establish similar uh, Catholic infertility practice or Catholic uh, OBGYN practice or family practices um, in different clinical scenarios, uh, different clinical settings. So uh, otherwise, you know, you'll just get to see how can this actually uh, be created in a Catholic healthcare system. As uh, most of the people here present today have no financial uh, relationships to disclose. The objectives for today that I wanted to cover was first to appreciate the ways in which Humana Vitae um, allows us to bring uh, a, a, different, a different angle to medicine. So how, how can a Catholic fertility practice really bring to life that message of Humana Vitae? I also want to help us understand the process of starting a fertility practice in a Catholic healthcare system and discuss the benefits and the challenges of having such an authentically Catholic fertility practice in a Catholic hospital. And lastly, also just to um, understand how Catholic fertility practices can address and treat the common underlying causes of infertility in a way that is morally acceptable within church teaching. So Humana Vitae had a lot to say about a lot of things. When we think about boiling down the message of Pope Paul VI and Humana Vitae specifically for how it applies to fertility care. And what I mean by that is the care of women and their fertility and also the care of couples with infertility. And from my reading of the document, I felt like there were three main things that Humana Vitae uh, brings out for us. <clears throat> the first is a call to uphold the dignity of married love, which is a surprisingly challenging uh, dictum to, to uh, carry out in today's world. The second would be um, an understanding of the regulation of birth by evidence-based observations of the fertility cycles. And last, there was a charge by Pope Paul VI to uphold the moral law which God has engraved on the nature of each man and each woman. So how do each of these aspects of Humana Vitae really take form in an authentically Catholic fertility practice? <clears throat> In terms of upholding the dignity of married love, I really feel like that comes down to the, the, the essence of what that means for fertility practice, means that each and every conception must occur as the result of a natural act of intercourse between a husband and wife. Um, there are varying discussions among um, theologians as to whether intrauterine insemination is acceptable within church teaching. I, I tend to draw the line and just say, um, and I'm not going to provide IUIs for patients. <clears throat> when, you, when you have this as your central focus of we're not doing IVF, we're not doing IUI, you were really supporting the couple. Actually, each woman feels then valued as an individual with intrinsic dignity. They're not simply anymore just a gestational carrier. Similarly, the husbands in this, uh, they have a much more active and involved role in the fertility process, and they're not being reduced only to being a sperm donor. And I don't mean to be crass or even funny by saying that. That is quite literally how husbands feel once they've been through the IUI, IVF process. I hear them saying things like that um, to me in the office. <laughs> Secondly, um, children are seen as a gift of uh, marriage and not a commodity to be, uh, to be bought. Next, Humana Vitae really did urge physicians and men and women of science to more fully investigate and to bring further scientific clarity to the menstrual and fertility cycle. And this actually incidentally, or maybe not so incidentally, gave rise to the development of many fertility awareness-based methods. <clears throat> but more specifically for what I provide for patients is this document inspired Dr. Thomas Hilders to really um, investigate and standardize the Billings method and create, sort of by accident, create the Creighton model system. And as a result of creating the Creighton model system, uh, then NAPR technology was developed and formed. <clears throat> so in a very real way, Pope Paul VI's exhortation in Humana Vitae inspired the work that led to a completely new understanding of women's health care and also for 
me to be able to do exactly what I'm doing today. So um, certainly indebted to Dr. Hilders, obviously, of course, indebted also to uh, Pope Paul VI. <clears throat> Lastly, Humana Vitae really has a call for us to uphold the, the moral law and the natural law. And this serves as a reminder to be comfortable putting uh, appropriate limits on what we will offer for fertility care. The result is that the essential meaning of procreation and the intrinsic value of each person are upheld with dignity and respect. So when we boil this down into what this looks like in a fertility practice, it means that treatments may assist in the procreative process but should never replace it. And that embryos should never be created or manipulated in the lab, which is the standard of care among secular in vitro fertilization clinics. <clears throat> the benefits of this approach cannot be underestimated. Just having these simple tenets that came out of Humana Vitae imbued into what we do with medical treatments, it opens up this entirely new way of actually looking at the woman, looking at the man, looking at the fertility that this couple shares. And it changes how we, as physicians, differentiate conditions and how we offer particular treatments. So it really cannot be underestimated how much this uh, sort of generates this individualize, diagnose, and treat the underlying cause approach as opposed to a one-size-fits-all assisted or artificial reproductive technology approach. <clears throat> so why Mercy Hospital? Well, I completed my residency at Mercy Hospital. It was a supportive program in which to uh, train, which I'll talk about a little bit more. It's also a very good, uh, solid Catholic hospital, um, despite the recent name change, which caused a little bit of... Uh, uh, dispute regarding this. I really think that it does strive um, to fulfill the mission that was originally outlined by the Sisters of Mercy. Also, uh, for me, as a NAPRO technology trained physician, it was essential to have the sort of basis or the foundational uh, support system that's provided by the Creighton Model Fertility Care Practitioners. And Mercy, the Mercy Hospital Fertility Care Center was actually the first to ever be established as a hospital department of any hospital in the country. And St. Louis has a huge um, sort of high density, I guess you could say, of uh, fertility care practitioners compared to many other geographical locations. So this was a fantastic location in which to build up this type of practice and to know that I was going to have the support from the fertility care practitioners on that side of things. <clears throat> um, so what I'm hoping to be able to do today is also to describe sort of what are the benefits of being in a Catholic healthcare system, what are some of the difficulties, and what are some of the things that we have to sort of pay attention to. Of course, as any uh, physician going out into practice, I would say there are primarily three uh, types of practice that we can go into. One is private practice. Another is a hospital-based practice, and lastly, an academic setting. And for me, what I wanted to do with my practice really seemed to fit most, um, most comfortably into a hospital-based practice. So the Mercy Hospital OBGYN residency program has historically been a supportive and a safe place for Catholic physicians who wish to be so-called NFP-only physicians to get their training. We knew that we weren't going to be compelled to perform abortions, to train in sterilizations, or even prescribe contraceptives during our four years of training, which um, to many people may be surprising, but actually this is a very difficult thing to be able to apply to, be accepted to, and actually train at a hospital system um, for OBGYN in one in which that you can actually have a conscientious objection and not have to um, do the so-called standard of care procedures. So in 2012, the St. Louis Review actually ran this um, article about us because there were seven of us at the time in this training program. And since, uh, since 20, about, yeah, about 2008 or so um, until now, there have been 17 NFP-only physicians to go through the Mercy Hospital training program, which is, I think, other than maybe uh, Sisters of Charity, it's probably one of the uh, sort of most prolific in being able to help train uh, physicians such, such as myself. The response to the article was overwhelming by the Catholic readers, and I thought it was just an excellent representation of, A, a lack of understanding in a way of what physicians who decide to be Catholic, authentically Catholic, and faithful physicians, what we sort of have to go through in the, in the process of training, but also, B, that 
there are physicians out there who are looking for ways to treat couples and treat patients in, in a way that is morally acceptable and also provides a more in-depth evaluation and treatment. So I figured with this as the backdrop uh, that Mercy would be at least supportive or open to the idea of my starting a practice uh, there after I completed my fellowship. The only thing I had to do is get this idea in front of the right people at the right time, which fortunately uh, did work out, of course. <clears throat> so I think if you're fortunate enough to have a Catholic hospital approach you and say, Dr. So-and-so, uh, we really want you to start this type of practice at our hospital. We really want to be able to provide this service for our patients. That's fantastic. I would say that's the minority. The majority of physicians will have to go and kind of make a pitch to the hospital where they would like to practice and um, ask the hospital to go out on a limb for them to, to actually support their practice. <clears throat> so in order to make this happen, to be able to grow this type of practice, it really requires a few things. First, you have to make this pitch to hospital administration. You have to be able to demonstrate the viability of this type of practice and also describe how this type of practice would add value to that Catholic healthcare system. Second, I think it's really important to be comfortable as a physician or as somebody who's a clinician who's early starting out at a practice like this is to be comfortable outlining what an authentically Catholic infertility practice looks like, both in the positive and in the negative. <clears throat> and I'm always surprised to see there's a significant misunderstanding of what Catholic fertility ethics actually means. And a lot of my friends and colleagues from residency still to this day probably have no idea that I prescribe Clomid or Letrozole or prescribe injectable medications because they think that, well, the Catholic Church says anything that's artificial, anything that's added couldn't be used. Well, as it turns out, of course, we can use medications to assist in um, procreation. It's just, like I said, you can't separate the unitive and the procreative. So it's, it's something so simple, but a lot of people don't realize that we can actually provide medical treatments that aid in assisting couples. Last and probably most importantly, it's, um, it's important to be able to describe to the hospital that you're pitching this to how you're going to be able to go about growing your practice. Obviously, these are the sort of four kind of pillars that I think that you can grow a practice on. Outstanding patient care, that's kind of our given. I mean, I, I really feel like with, with what we provide and how we provide this type of care for patients, it, it would be a very strange exception to the rule to actually have a physician who doesn't provide excellent care for patients when they're using the Creighton model fertility awareness-based methods, natural family planning, or NAPR technology. Second, to be involved in outreach and education to help to spread the news and spread the word about what your practice might look like. Um, to be proactive in marketing efforts early on in the practice and then at various stages um, in building the practice. And lastly, to be diligent in working to build relationships with colleagues at your Catholic healthcare system. So when a physician or a group of physicians might decide that they're going to make this pitch to a, to a hospital, I think it's important for them to present to Catholic hospital administrators in a very clear and relevant way how this type of practice um, fulfills an unmet need and also adds value to their hospital. And also, why, why does it even matter? Why does it matter to provide this different type of service with, in my case, NAPAR technology and the Creighton model? As far as fulfilling an unmet need, this is, we're offering something that's completely unique and it's also a highly successful and highly effective way of helping couples who struggle with infertility to be able to achieve pregnancy. And it's doing so within the moral uh, teachings of the church. We're not having to go around anything, we're not having to duck under anything or, or pretend that we're not doing some types of infertility treatments. Instead, we're identifying the underlying cause. We're working diligently to help the couples understand their cycle, understand their fertility, and then apply medical and surgical treatments to be able to help them achieve pregnancy. Second, I think it's always important when you're approaching a hospital to discuss how your type of practice would help to fulfill the Catholic mission of the hospital, which by extension isn't too difficult. I mean, you're saying more or less that we're going to treat people in every scenario and every walk of life <clears throat> the way that uh, God would want us to treat them. And, um, and nothing that we're going to do would be contrary to either the natural law or the moral law. And then adding value. This is a really important component, especially for the administrators, and it's no offense to them, of course, but they're going to want to know that this type of practice can be financially successful, but also that it can add value to the hospital in terms of a spiritual or mission-based sense. <clears throat> 
uh, this, you know, first of all, this, this type of practice is going to offer a morally acceptable path for treatment of infertility for couples. Um, secondly, this practice is financial for a variety, financially independent and can be very successful for a variety of reasons that are different from an average OBGYN practice or an average internal medicine practice. Uh, a, we're providing um, a, a type of treatment that is uh, few and far between. There aren't very many physicians that are providing this. And uh, once couples and once women start to learn about what you actually do to assess them as a person, not just as a, as a disease or a symptom, and treat them, um, the word spreads very quickly from one person to another. Also, what's a little bit different about this type of practice is that the draw radius, and this is sort of, I, I made this point early on when I was talking to Mercy, the draw radius for this type of clinical practice is very different than your average OBGYN practice. An average OBGYN practice should more or less expect to see patients from anywhere in the metroplex. For our practice, we have uh, a certain percentage, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but let's say five to 10% of our patients are coming from two to three hours away. And we also see patients from all over the country who come for uh, mostly for surgical management. So it's a very different type of practice than what a hospital is used to seeing with an OBGYN practice because uh, just because of the very work that we do and, and what we provide for patients. <clears throat> also, which is a little bit unusual for um, administrators to sort of consider is that we have this other referral network called fertility care practitioners um, or uh, other, uh, other methods of fertility awareness based uh, uh, methods of family planning where you get referrals from um, some non-clinical um, uh, sources. And so then you have the ability to grow your practice simply based on those referrals because you're providing a service one-on-one -on -one for those patients. <clears throat> Secondly, we talked about the importance of being comfortable defining what the practice really means um, in terms of the ethical and moral boundaries. While it may seem unnecessary to have to even broach this topic with a Catholic hospital, I do think it's still important to describe really what the Catholic character of this practice looks like, um, both for the hospital but also for your patients in an ongoing setting. Um, for us, it really means being comfortable with drawing those distinctions, drawing those boundaries to identify both the positive and the negative, meaning what we will provide and what we won't provide. Um, and having them be comfortable knowing that we will always practice within the ethical and religious directives. Because like I said early on, um, for a lot of administrators, a lot of uh, non-clinical uh, folks, even clinical folks of course, um, there is this misunderstanding that Catholic and infertility treatments, they can't really mix. <clears throat> this is the way to have your picture taken. Put your face in a hole so nobody can actually recognize you. <laughs> so as far as what we do offer, we, um, we let our patients know that we offer comprehensive diagnostic evaluation of their symptoms, whether their symptom is infertility or whether the symptom is heavy or painful periods or irregular cycles. We also promote awareness of the natural cycles uh, of fertility and infertility. In our practice, we're using the Creighton model um, solely. And although some couples, of course, will be charting with other methods, and that's okay if that's what's working for them at the time. Um, we offer treatments for the underlying conditions, which means that we're offering treatments for endometriosis, for polycystic ovaries, for block fallopian tubes, for cervical factor infertility, for male factor infertility, um, anything that could potentially be a contributing source to infertility is something that we can provide treatments for. So I think some are also surprised, wow, a gynecologist trained in APRA technology has something to say about male infertility? How do you actually do that? So we actually do have um, excellent treatments for those as well. We do offer ovulation induction like Clomid and Letrozole and injectable medications, which is important to, um, to elucidate for any hospital who's looking at your practice and wants to know that this isn't just a little bit of like an NFP practice or a Catholic practice. They're not going to really get busy and they're not going to really appeal to the masses. Well, most certainly we, we do. And then lastly, um, restorative reproductive surgery is a core um, part of what we offer with NAPR technology is to correct the underlying conditions to restore normal anatomy to allow to um, help to improve a woman's uh, ability to achieve health and also achieve uh, pregnancy. And finally, to support adoption as a means for uh, building a family when our infertility treatments are not successful, as opposed to saying, if you fail with this, then automatically you need to go to IVF. So as I said earlier, we don't offer uh, artificial reproductive technologies, including IUI and IVF. 
We do not offer referrals for IVF or abortive services. And then lastly, this is a little bit nuanced, but we actually don't even do, it shouldn't, shouldn't be too much of a surprise, we don't offer ovulation medications for unmarried couples. And the reason is because you're implicitly saying this is the time that you should have intercourse in order to help uh, you know, increase your ability to achieve pregnancy. However, we do still diagnose and treat those underlying issues in those uh, unmarried couples. As far as growing the practice, um, like I said earlier, outstanding patient care, having um, a continuous efforts for outreach and education in the community, continuing with marketing both at the beginning of the practice and at various intervals during the practice, and then building those good relationships with your colleagues. Like I said, I think it's unusual, it would, it would be very unusual to find a physician who's practicing NAPR technology or, or helps couples who are charting with uh, FABM to not provide a person-oriented, um, compassionate type of uh, healthcare. And then patients are also surprisingly, uh, also really appreciate our surprisingly unique experience, or they have a surprisingly unique experience of actually being listened to and treated as an individual person with dignity versus being shuttled through this one-size-fits-all uh, method of ART among uh, standard secular clinics. So I think that's really refreshing to patients. And once you offer them this life-affirming alternative to IVF, it's infective. I mean, they want to go out and tell their friends and tell their sisters and tell their moms. And so, not surprisingly, you see a lot of patients who come as referrals from current patients. Good care is always going to be the best care. As far as outreach and education, I think it's, um, it's important, to, despite the fact that physicians get very busy early in practice, it's important to set aside time to be able to present at conferences. Although this might count, I really actually mean conferences that aren't specifically geared toward um, a like-minded audience. Uh, and this diagram on the right is to remind me that um, in February, I was actually, and I still don't really know why, but I was actually asked to speak at a conference um, that was uh, being uh, put on by an IVF clinic here in St. Louis. <coughs> and I assume that they knew what I did to some degree because they asked me to speak. But it was an awesome opportunity to be able to go out and with joy and confidence and good medical background to be able to present what we have with NAPR technology and with the Creighton model and give this completely fresh perspective to so many couples who are going through the IVF process. And they all are sitting there thinking to themselves, why was I never told about this? And why did nobody else ever care why I actually can't get pregnant? So not surprisingly, at the end of the talk, a lot of people came up and said, can we have a business card? You know, when's your first opening? I mean, we're still seeing patients who are making appointments just from that, from that talk in February. Um, also being available for interviews with media, both Catholic and secular, um, just to help to um, spread this information in a very positive way. <clears throat> and um, contributing to even smaller discussion groups. So there's a couple um, that puts on a Theology of the Body discussion group for uh, Lindenwood, Lindenwood University students here in St. Louis. And every so often they'll invite um, physicians to come and talk who have uh, expressed an interest in helping. So it's, it's just a great opportunity to be able to discuss what the Theology of the Body means and as opposed to what the secular world offers and then how that um, finds its way into uh, organic, healthy women's health care. It's also important, I think, to stay involved in educational programs for the religious side of, uh, of our community, right? So the seminarians, the priests, the, the deacons, to be able to be there as a medical uh, resource for them, to let them have your cell phone number, have your email number, to, to communicate with those um, priests, and to also to say, hey, if you ever have a question, if you ever have a, a couple or a patient or, or a, a, a woman who has difficulties following NFP, like the question earlier, for some reason, please have them reach out to us. We can help. And then as much as possible, you know, if, obviously if you're in, a, uh, in an academic setting, your life is uh, academic. You're always involved with the, the training and education of medical students and residents. Um, but even for those of us who are in either private practice or hospital-based settings, to make yourself available for um, different opportunities to be involved in the education of young physicians. Because again, this, this might be the only time they actually hear an accurate representation of what NFP really is or what, um, what is out there beyond just uh, IVF. 
I was a little hesitant to actually put this picture up because I didn't want to be self-promoting, but I'd, let's just say if you agree to do articles like this, you have to be ready for the posed, kind of <laughs> corny looking uh, medical photos. So. <clears throat> so marketing really shouldn't be an ugly word. I mean, it, I think that a lot of times we think, okay, if we're going to provide great service, we're going to have patients find us, they're going to tell each other's friends and family about us, but we really want to try to you know, meet and reach far more women and far more couples than, than even that would provide. So not being shy about having an online presence, a good website, um, making yourself findable in Google, have a way that uh, patients can find you, find your office hours. I mean, just simple, sort of tedious things. But I'd, I'm always surprised when I go and kind of Google my friends from, from residency. <clears throat> I would say out of six in our class, I'm the only one who's actually created a Google account for myself where patients can find you, can find your office hours, can put in ratings. It seems so trivial, but when you ask your patients, hey, how did you find us? Well, they said, well, we just Googled and you came up and I say, okay, that's great. You know, how did, how did you decide our, our practice versus somebody else's? And, it, and almost invariably they'll say, it's because of the reviews I read about how you actually investigate the issues, how you actually treat the underlying causes. That's why I made the appointment. So I really don't think it can be underestimated the importance of having you know, an accurate and personalized health grades page or rate MDs page or whatever it might be for, for your area. I will admit I'm not into Facebook, Twitter, or any of those other things, so I, I don't do any of that. Um, but I do see a lot of practices, even an IVF practice here in town, who uh, they get a lot of patients from their Facebook uh, marketing. So it's certainly something to, to consider. Um, as far as building relationships, I think this, um, this goes a long way in terms of helping to give credibility to what you're doing, to be out in the open about what you provide, and also to help encourage those physicians who you may sort of know peripherally from meeting them in the doctor's lounge um, to actually consider you as a, a place where they can refer patients with difficult um, clinical uh, issues. Consult, consult letters I almost use as what my mom would call teaching moments. Um, not to be sort of annoying about it, but more or less when I, when I have a, a patient who is either referred to me by a physician who doesn't understand what we do with Creighton Model and Napper Technology, or um, who found us by another avenue, I will send each of these physicians a consult letter to describe, here's how we assess what's going on, and here's our sort of diagnostic treatment plan, and here are the types of treatments that we would offer for this patient. So they just get a sense of what we actually provide, which is a little bit different, or a lot of it different, actually, than, than what is usually provided through a standard fertility clinic. And I think having that, that chance to have that you know, ongoing interaction with physicians, even, like I said, clear communication with providers regarding the care of mutual patients. In that case, what I mean is that every time I take a patient to surgery, I check and see who has been this physician, this, this patient's physician in the past. And I'll send that physician, I probably already sent them a consult letter, but I'll send them another follow-up letter to say, this is what we found at surgery, this is what we provided, this is how NAPR, NAPR technology surgery is different than what they might have gotten with a, with a different surgeon. <clears throat> And then lastly, I think it's important to keep the hospital, especially those hospital administrators who have now sort of taken a chance on you, to keep them up to date as far as how the practice is going with regards to productivity, your reach, how many patients you've seen, what your success rates are. So something else which requires a little bit of work and effort, but in our, in our practice, we actually keep track of every single patient in a secure database, how long they've had infertility, what their underlying diagnosis was, how, when they achieve pregnancy. So we know our pregnancy rates, we know our miscarriage rates, we know what percentage of patients come from outside the Metroplex, we know what percentage of patients have had surgery. And so that's all great information to be able to use. For example, right now I'm using that to help to justify to Mercy, this is why I need another physician because we have really long wait times, this is our, our outcome, this is how many patients we're getting from outside the Mercy system, which is about 65% of our patients actually come from outside Mercy, which for a hospital system is a big deal because those are all new patients who have a new contact with a, with a physician office, and then the hope is that they can convert into sort of patients or consumers for life. I mean, it makes me kind of feel weird just to say that. But that's kind of the goal of, of, of hospitals like this is to help to invite more patients into their, into their community of, of hospitals. So when we look at a fertility practice that's primarily providing NAPRA technology, it's important, of course, like I said, to have good hospital support. It's also totally essential. Dr. Hilder says that the, the Creighton model and NAPRA technology are, are two sides of a double-stranded helix like DNA. It's in, absolutely essential to have excellent fertility care support. 
of course, it's always helpful to have referrals from other OBGYNs and family practice uh, physicians to help to bring patients to you. And then once they achieve pregnancy, in my case, I don't do OB, so I help to refer those patients back. Um, and then it's also you know, completely necessary to have good support from the community and also from your patients. And I think that all springs from us providing this type of really top-notch, wholesome, good quality uh, medical care. <clears throat> so I just want to close by saying I think that there are a lot of benefits to bringing this type of uh, practice to a Catholic, Catholic health care system, because I think it further supports um, the identity and the mission of, uh, of a Catholic hospital by providing this life-affirming, moral, authentically Catholic uh, approach to the treatment of women's health and infertility. And while the expectations and external pressures from the secular world can at times make this task seem um, uh, en enormously daunting, I really believe that the prophetic words and the wisdom of uh, Pope Paul VI and Humana Vitae really give us that courage that's necessary, give us our conviction to, to really joyfully bring this type of health care, uh, authentically um, Catholic, good health care to women, and also um, to be able to share it with our colleagues, to be able to share it with the entire hospital system in which we, in which we grow our practice. So thanks so much for your time. I guess we'll take questions at the end.